You're recording, you're recording. I'm recording. So um, I picked this article because I think it explains everything about MS. <laughs> so <laughs> it ties together every theory there is. So the good thing about this article that is that everyone can be happy. So if you believe that EBV is the cause of MS, it's there. If you think it's all about the gut, it's there. If you think B cells are important, it's there too. If you think T cells are important, it's there too. So that's the real magic about this article that nobody can actually be disappointed because it's it suits every every theory. So um, the backgrounds. Uh, so I um, so I I was very happy that Stephen Hauser wrote an editorial about this paper because <laughs> he 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 summarized it quite neatly and um, he also um, gave great context um, to understand or to grasp the full um, um, yeah the full width of the article. So the things that um, have become clear to us um, uh, about MS over the preceding years are first that indeed B cell B cell therapies are much more efficient or are a very efficient way to target. Um, the information in MS, and so um, also it's in in the early years or yeah, like decades ago, it was thought that it might have to do with the orthoclonal bands. So and just the more antibody related functions of B cells. It has now become clear that this is probably not the most important uh, mode of action of B cells in MS, and that um, they are probably pat pathogenic because of their antigen presenting functions. Um, in addition, we also know that um, MS um, is um, associated with some environmental risk factors, um, such as EBV, smoking, low vitamin D, but also um, some gut microbiota and other. Um, we know that the HLA DRB1-1501 is the most important genetic risk factor for MS, and this, so this is... Um, the HLA region is a region that codes for... Um, antigen presenting receptors or receptors that can capture ant antigens or detect antigens in, in its environment on B cells and on uh, monocytes and other antigen presenting cells. And so um, this, again, links antigen presentation with MS. So the odds ratio of having one um, allele is, is around 3.9. Um, so um, having two of these alleles increases your risk um, to or your susceptibility to MS at least 10 times compared to people not carrying those alleles. Um, and then we also know that um, T cells must have something to do with MS. Uh, <laughs> so uh, because um, the, the biggest animal model um, also in uh, MS is the EAA model and um, it clearly triggers, triggers demyelination in the central nervous system, not exactly the same as in MS, but still demyelination after um, T cells are probed with myelin antigens. Um, so this is the sort of background um, on for the article. Um, the big problem obviously in MS is that we don't know what triggers this. Um, so the antigen itself is not known. So we don't know what stimulates B cells. We don't know what stimulates T cells. We don't know what each HLA receptors detect. So that is the still the big unknown um, in MS. And so this slide I borrowed from Anne Goris. <laughs> so this is her famous slide in which she proves um, that all um, environmental risk, risk factors are less important than HLA. Um, so this uh, is the risk associated with HLA. And here um, she puts all the environmental risk factors. And then you see that the relative risk associated with EBV is much lower than HLA. Uh, but I just put it because it was a good summary of everything. And it, um, I think we can also add the, um, um, so the uh, gut microbiota, maybe childhood obesity, et cetera, all in this graph. And um, you see that many, 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 many different alterations uh, contribute to, um, or many different factors contribute to risk in MS. And so the big, the article that was the sort of, um, that uh, made this article po possible is also from the same group, but two years ago. And um, so I'm so happy that these papers have this um, graphical abstract because it's so easy to understand what they've done based on that. So um, what I understand is that two years ago, so the group from Roland Martin, they showed that T cells, that they can be activated with endogenous peptides, if I'm correct. So it means that, um, so you don't need 
peptides coming from external, externally, so outside of the body, body to generate autoreactive um, T cells. And so they, um, and so the, for this to happen, an interplay between memory B cells and T cells has to happen. And they, one of the antigens or peptides that could induce this dynamic was this um, RAS guanyl releasing protein 2. So this is an intracellular protein that um, sometimes is presented on these HLA receptors um, by B cells, and then they can stimulate T cells. And these um, T cells, they um, migrate, um, ca can potentially migrate to the brain. And this, um, this peptide, so this ra RAS GRP2 is also present in the brain because it can also be expressed by neurons. And so in this article two years ago, they showed that memory B cells, hmm, by um, recognizing this intracellular epitope, could stimulate T cells for them to become actually autoreactive because this, again, neurons in the brain, because um, also neurons in the brain express this, um, this specific protein. Um, and um, so an important term, term that will appear in the article is the immunopeptidome. So apparently this means that uh, all peptides or all peptides associated or that can be detected by HLA receptors, just as a sort of background definition. And then, um, so I, I first gonna um, tell the big story and then I will show some sort of, some of the experiments they've done. So the first big, um, big finding of this article um, is um, that they characterize the peptides recognized by DR2A and DR2B. And so DR2A and DR2B are two genes that code um, for a specific HLA receptor that appears on B cells and monocytes or other antigen presenting cells. Um, and so um, these, so these and these, um, so they characterize the peptides recognized by these two anti antigen receptors. And what, what has become clear is that these um, HLA receptors, that they detect a whole range of peptides, but that a considerable amount of these peptides are self antigens. So it means that pieces of the receptor itself are mysteriously recognized by the receptor and can then um, yeah, trigger um, signaling. Um, and so, um, so DRTA, and then in addition, they also discovered so that the DR2A receptor um, preferentially um, presented self peptides from the beta chains encoded by these genes and that DR2B, so the second receptor, um, preferentially presented self-peptides from the alpha chain. Um, and so, um, um, so the first big, the, the, sec, the, the, the first uh, finding of the article is first that um, DR2A and DR2B receptors, which are expressed by B cells, can f detect um, antigens, but can are also a source of antigens them, themselves, actually. Um, and so um, these are the um, articles that are the experiments that kind of, um, yeah, um, that back this, this, this um, finding. Um, so I think the most important um, experiment to, um, 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 that's, yeah, is in line with these, this statement it, or is the one that you find under H and Y. So here you see um, the percentage of unique peptides detected by DR2A receptor and the DR2B receptor. And you see that um, um, in B cells, so the blue color, uh, so that for example, in lepsin limiting MS, that a significant of the amount of the peptides recognized um, is specific to B cells or specific to monocytes, and that there is only a very limited amount of overlap between monocytes and B cells. So each are unique. Um, so each antigen presenting cell is unique in the range of peptides um, they recognize, and there is very little overlap between the different um, subtypes. And then in this, this range of experiments, um, they kind of established that the peptides recognized by B cells or monocytes, um, to what extent they were self-peptides, so 
originating from the receptor itself. And then especially here, so you see in DR2A receptors that approximately a little bit less than half of the peptides recognized by this receptor is coming from the HLA2 molecule. So it's actually a self-peptide. And this is very specific for the B cells and it's not happening with monocytes, so the other antigen presenting cell. Um, and then, um, so they also, um, um, yeah, so this is another way of showing the same um, in which they also um, state, you kind of prove that B cells are much more likely to um, re respond to, uh, produce self and self peptides than other cells. And then this experiment has to show the link between um, the DR2A and then the um, responding to the beta chain and the DR2B responding to alpha chain peptides. And then here, um, um, this is also a very important issue. They checked whether these self peptides were in which tissues that these self peptides were present. And so, um, what they found is that these self-peptides are indeed very present in B cells um, or on B cells and in thymic tissue, but they couldn't find any of these self-peptides in the brain. So in MS brain tissue, none of these self-peptides were found, which obviously opens up. Uh, yeah, it means that the, these receptors respond to it in the periphery, but that these self-peptides do not trigger um, this auto-reactivity in the brain itself. Mm? So that there must be a sort of different trigger for that purpose. Um, so this was, so these were, was the first infusion. So they characterized DR2A, DR2B peptides. They discovered that uh, for B cells at least, these receptors responded to self-peptides um, and um, to, cel uh, to self-peptides. And then, um, so they also, the second phase of the article focused on whether B cells recognizing these self-peptides, whether they can also stimulate um, CD4 T cells. Mm -hmm. So whether this interaction, this immunological interaction is possible. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so uh, obviously they demonstrated that when B cells present, so the HLA receptor on B cells presents these peptides to T cells that indeed the T cell um, responds to it and becomes activated. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so they have this set of experiments uh, backing this up. So um, I think, uh, yeah, one of the most um, um, interesting experiments is this first one. Uh, here you see, um, so you see the sort of, so on the X axis, it has to reflect the response. So the immunological response to a certain epitope. And then you see that in people with relapsing remitting MS, plotted here that there is that T cells, uh, CD4 T cells indeed respond to these self peptides and that the response is bigger than in healthy uh, controls and that this response is not there um, for other triggers, immunological triggers like this CEF2 peptide pool and they also check this for tetanoid, um, uh, tetanoid peptides. So, um, and then they checked, so this could all be undone by adding an antibody against HLA, okay, fine, fine. Um, which you see here. So this undoes the immunological um, response. Um, and then they did additional experiments to look at the phenotype of these um, T cells that are generated. And so these, so, and they did that by quantifying the, um, the uh, cytokine levels. Um, that are produced by these T cells stimulated by self peptides. And then they, um, these T cells had a TH1 phenotype based on the um, cytokine patterns that they, um, that, that they show, of, that they find here. Um, and then a second um, part uh, of a set of experiments was to demonstrate that um, the self peptides oh, okay. could not okay. only stimulate the CD4 T cells, uh, but that I they also it. stimulated auto reactive CD4 T cells because those are that's obviously more pathogenic than any given. T cells. So that's why um, they looked. Um, um, so first of all, they characterized. Um, which, so whether it were memory or naive oh, okay. and, uh, who cells that, the, that responded the, to, to the, um, to the uh, self-peptides. And then you see here, oh, so oh, um, these are the memory T cells. And um, when self-peptides are presented to them, there is a much higher response in, with this proliferation marker than um, with naive T cells. So with naive T cells, there is almost no response. With memory T cells, is, he on any you, is anyone? 
Can anyone? I think yeah. Imam, maybe no, you can mute you, 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 uh, your uh, uh, microphone. Can, uh, but maybe yeah. I can mute. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, so perfect. And then, um, so then they also checked. So, uh, um, so first of all, memory T cells, and then they checked um, um, what kind of other um, antigens could also um, elicit um, um, uh, or stimulate these receptors. So these DR2A receptors, DR2B receptors, they checked and uh, whether they only res responded to the self-peptides or whether which other um, epitopes could also stimulate these receptors. And then they found that um, also myelin basic uh, protein um, could um, stimulate um, the receptor. Um, and then, um, so that was a second finding. And then also what we already knew from the previous article that this um, internal protein, this RAS GRP2 could also stimulate this um, these receptors. So this DR2A and DR2B HLA receptors are stimulated by their self-peptides, but they're also stimulated um, by myelin basic proteins, and they are also stimulated by um, this um, sort of RAS GRP2, so this internal um, protein um, that is present in, in many different cells um, in the body. Um, and then, so then there was the um, they wanted to know whether autoreactive clones that have been found in people with MS, hmm, um, whether they responded to um, these peptides. And then here you see, so you see a T-cell clone with different numbers um, and then so different T-cell clones. And then you see that there is one clone, so the TCC14, which is known um, to respond to this RAS that also responds to this HLA self-peptides. And then they checked again the phenotype of cytokines, I think, um, or maybe that's in another, um, that is um, elicited by this, these T cell clones. Uh, or that's maybe the next set of experiments. But anyway, so the TCC14, um, that's a T cell clone responding to um, this RAS, so this, in, this internal protein, the self peptides, and then potentially also to uh, myelin basic protein. And then, so the next set of, ex so yes, so this was the second bi big conclusion um, of the paper. So it means that um, the memory B cells mm, um, can, with carrying this HLA receptor, can stimulate um, T cells um, and can stimulate autoreactive T cells, um, which are potentially pathogenic in MS. And then um, there is this third um, conclusion. So then what they also noticed um, is that, um, so these receptors respond, um, respond to self-peptides, but they also seem to respond to certain environmental peptides coming from um, EBV and coming from, uh, so Epstein-Barr virus and um, the Ackermansia mucinifilia. So another sort of, um, my, so it's a sort of bacterium present in the gut and that is overrepresented in the gut of people with MS. Um, and so here you see um, a figure summarizing it all. So it means B cells um, and they, their HLA receptors, they respond to um, foreign peptides coming, for example, from these two bacteria. Um, and they also respond to self-peptides, for example, from, the, from this RAS GRP2. They stimulate T cells and then T cells become uh, become activated and can penetrate and can these activated P cells can enter the brain. Mm -hmm. So this would be a sort of third function of these receptors in which these receptors by uh, recognizing these foreign epitopes um, could elicit a sort of um, autoreactive T cell repertoire um, that also recognizes them indirectly epitopes in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so what they did also an, um, find is that the way, so the extent to which these epitopes can stimulate T cells is not similar for all. Eh? So the lowest stimulation is coming from um, the, um, from this, I think from the self peptides and the highest stimulation is coming from this um, RAS GRP2 and somewhere in the middle, we find Epstein-Barr and this um, other gut bacterium. And so then the experiments backing this up are first of all this, 
Um, so in which um, they show again uh, this hierarchy in um, T cell response. And you see that, um, for example, here, um, this is um, the proliferation um, seen with a specific T cell clone. And you see that there is much higher proliferation with this Rust GRP2 than with the self peptides. Um, and then um, here they also demonstrate that uh, it's not only the TCC14, but also the other T cell clones respond to a certain extent to this um, to um, self peptides and this Ras GRB2P2, and the response is always um, is more pronounced with this Ras GRP2. Um, and then um, here they um, they kind of show the um, response of these T-cell clones to um, the peptides associated with EBV and with um, um, the Ackermansia. And so uh, here they show that the T-cell clones also so, so respond to some of these proteins. So based on, again, the proliferation of T-cells after entering co contact with these peptides. And then they checked for the transcriptome and they checked for the cytokine um, responses elicited by these activated T-cells and that was compatible with TH2 phenotype. Um, and then um, again here, um, they try to tie everything together um, and they, um, um, they kind of, what did I put? Um, so, all right, yeah, it's, it's actually more of the same. It's um, again showing that um, the T cell, um, the T cell um, clones response to these environmental proteins um, and what kind of um, reaction uh, signaling this induces. So um, in summary, this is the graphical abstract of the paper. And I think it's quite nicely summarized everything that they have done. So first of all, um, so what we know is that HLA-DR15 is the biggest genetic risk factor in MS, that this haplotype, so this HLA-DR15 haplotype, that it um, results into um, two common HLA receptors, which are found on B cells and monocytes. Um, and these receptors, so the first thing that they did in the article was to find to which specific antibody, to which specific peptides these receptors respond. And then it became clear that they uh, respond to uh, self-peptides and that these self-peptides are mainly present on B cells, but not present in the brain. And then um, by additional experiments, they clearly show that the, um, that naive T cells are selected in the, uh, in the thymus or thymus. Um, and then um, uh, based on, on their affinity with HLA receptors. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, um, so they're positively or negatively selected based on those affinity levels. Then they enter the peripheral blood. Um, and then these, these naive T cells can become activated based on foreign epitopes, which is good. This is a sort of protective mechanism. Um, so it's good that they, Theoretically, it's good that cells respond to foreign epitopes. Um, but then um, when they become activated, um, so there is this, um, they can be converted into memory T cells. Mm -hmm. um, and um, whenever then um, they encounter a B cell mm -hmm, presenting these self peptides, they will also so there will be cross-reactivity uh, because the um, receptors recognizing these foreign epitopes also recognize these self-peptides. Mm -hmm. And this interaction mm -hmm, can lead to an activated um, T cell that then also, so there is a lot of cross-reactivity, uh, responds to um, a, a sort of internal peptide that can appear on the cell surface, I assume. Um, and then um, this self-peptide, this Ras GRP2, hmm, um, is um, present both in the peripheral blood and in the brain. So the hypothesis would be that this T cell is actually kind of triggered by a foreign epitope, but then also hmm, it's, first of all, a foreign epitope that looks like an HLA peptide, um, and then cross-reacts with an epitope in the brain and triggers inflammation. So that would um, be the theory uh, about MS um, 
uh, about the, uh, yeah, at least uh, an important trigger to develop CNS inflammation based on this article. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the question is obviously, I think the biggest question is this, is this, so this RAS GRP2, so this self, this, this internal protein that triggers, is such an important trigger for the HLA receptors and for this, this autoreactive T cells. Yeah, the question is, uh, where does it come from? Is this spontaneously present on the cell surface or is this something that appears on, in cells when they are damaged? Um, and or the, is it is this a consequence of inflammation or is this a pre a prelude to inflammation? I think that is not entirely clear, and I don't think the authors are very um, uh, have an have a, an explanation for that. Um, and then um, so um, yeah, so that's still something that is unsolved. Um, and. Um, Yeah, and so the question, the second question is also the fact that I don't find these self-peptides in the brain. Um, so obviously it would be easier if they were present there, uh, but they're not. Um, so it means that um, at least in the brain, these, these autoreactive T cells should be triggered by something else. Um, and so the, you know, the entire cascade of how this all gets activated um, is so, and how this exactly propagates the inflammation in the brain, I don't think that's entirely clear. So this is just, um, there is a lot of assumptions there. Um, and then, um, so I, what I understand is that um, in regardless uh, of the um, uh, hypothesis about MS, that the article generates many different insights on B cells, um, on what, to what peptides B cells respond, um, that's a significant amount of them are self-peptides, um, that B cells respond to different antigens than other um, antigen presenting cells, um, and that, um, that uh, B cells responding to these self-peptides, they can also stimulate autoreactive T cells. Um, so um, I guess those are the bigger immunological insights independent of the um, uh, regardless of the MS. So, and then, yeah, I think uh, the question is also how would this mode of action or if this would be confirmed and um, more extensively documented in different papers. Um, so um, how would this lead to treatment? So, yeah, I guess what they suggest is that um, small molecules need to be designed that kind of block the groove. So the peptide groove of these HLA receptors, but yeah, I don't know whether um, that is realistic and whether um, um, that would be a good strategy um, because when, yeah, I, I don't know whether these receptors are in that redundant that you can just block its groove and no other, it would have no consequences in terms of infection, I don't know. Um, but um, this is one of the things they suggest uh, as a potential uh, treatment strategy for the future. So, David, you want to talk? You, you, you thought about this a lot, Dave. You want to have a comment on this paper, Dave? You're mute. You're mute, Dave. Well, thank you, Ida. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I haven't really thought a lot about this paper um, <laughs> because, you know, I question, I question most of it. So, um, okay. you know, I question the basis of the paper. Um, can I just show you a couple of, a couple of slides? Yeah, yeah. Slides, uh, just, um, I'm just going to show my, uh, if I can... Share my screen. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Can you share? I, I don't think I. Can I share now? Restricted. You cannot share while the other participant is. You have to unshare. You have to stop, stop sharing. Share. Yes. Um. Okay. So if I can, just share my screen. I think the, what my, my big concern about this is, is actually the founding ideas on which this is based. Mm -hmm. And so I go back to the original paper where um, they'd found auto presentation by the B cell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think what they did is they, they um, had that data and then had to find an antigen and they came up with this RASP GPR. Mm -hmm. Now, I personally don't believe it's actually CNS expressed. 
And this is the staining, if you look here, mm -hmm. you can see it around the gray matter. And so there's no, there's, no, there's no staining in the white matter. So are we led to believe that if this is important, yeah. that MS would be just a gray matter disease and there would be nothing in the white matter? Now, the thing that you have to look at is that blood vessel just at the top. Mm -hmm. You see it, it's just full of brown. So this is probably artifact. It's artifactual staining. So we know when you get a monoclonal antibody, it picks up um, um, tissue and quite often it picks up neurons and that's probably what that is. So then we kind of look at the message and you can go to as many different brain atlases. This is the um, protein atlas. Essentially, there's no expression. Here's uh, humans, essentially no expression in, in neurons. Yeah. Bio GPS. Again, no expression in the brain, loads of it in B cells. And therefore, it makes perfect sense why it could be a, a reactivity because you're presenting an antigen that's on a B cell. And, and therefore, that if a T cell is reactive to it, it, it can respond to a B cell. But it then takes a big jump to, sh to suggest that's actually something to do with the brain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the, the whole thing starts to tumble. Um, yeah. You know, and then you're thinking about, you know, looking for antigens expressed in the brain that mm -hmm. B cells present. Well, we, we've known about lots of them, like alpha B crystalline. I think everybody will accept, based mm -hmm. on a lot of people, that that is the dominant antigen expressed in an MS brain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and B cells present it and they can present the T cells. So I think they've really constructed a story just to try and concoct something to do with this um whole scenario mm -hmm. and then i guess the question is is what is the logic of 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 the b cells and i guess the question is 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 how do those peptides associate and one would imagine when you're um you know you've got your empty mhc class 2 molecules in the endosome maybe there's breakdown of the class 2 and you would think there would be a natural affinity perhaps mm. for the alpha and the beta chain Mm -hmm. and maybe that's why they're finding the beta reacts with the alpha and the alpha mm. with the beta. And I don't understand kind of the logic. And, you know, I guess we also have the T cells, which then they have MHC plus two. So it, it, it seems a very, very, very contrived s s s system. Um, and I guess the question then you, you say, if you're thinking about hypothesis, what would you do to question the hypotheses? Um, and I guess, first of all, you have to question, is there any evidence that T cells are important based on response to therapy? Um, I know that's a, a difficult one. Um, so I, I mean, think but the, but I think the HLA, very, very... But David, how do you explain the HLA? How do I explain the peptides? I mean... No, 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 not the, no just the HLA association with MS, if T cells well, are... Well, like, well, there's two ways you can actually ex uh, explain it via um, viral load. So um, the HLA is a co-receptor for EBV and um, the HLA-DR 150101 increases the EBV uh, viral load by four times. Mm -hmm. And then the A2, which is uh, suppressive, reduces the viral load. So that's kind of one, one example how you can explain the HLA association. I mean... Yeah, but I... I probably think, personally, I think it's just, I think every cell can be involved to a certain extent, isn't I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're right. I mean, I'm, and, 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 you know, you, you see DR2 and you, you assume T cells. But, um, you know, is this taken as any more closer to a solution or is it just lots of... What, it, what it does suggest, I mean, going down to the basics of this paper, David, it does suggest that the B cell... Uh, um, and the monocyte, the, oh. well, the, the hematopoietic um, side of antigen presentation. So let's assume the monocyte mm. slash dendritic cell are processing and expressing antigen differently to B cells. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. why, because it's, yeah. it was only the B cell compartment that expressed these um, yeah. uh, self-peptides. Self-peptides. I mean, mm. that's, that's, been, that's been reported before that B cells preferentially present self um self-peptides or peptides that they're responsive to yeah so there so is there, a difference so there's a difference between that which i didn't quite appreciate yeah. um but i was always taught when i did immunology in med school that um 
the MHC are always always got a peptide in and they never they never on the surface without a peptide mm. and the peptide happens to be most of the time self peptides that are meant to be low affinity low avidity and they just keep the structure in like they they, they um, keep they f allow the uh, MHC to form in the in the, in the uh, endosomes uh, which stabilizes them and then they get then they get competed out by uh, pathogenic or high affinity mm. And so the fact that you've got self peptide there means nothing. I think it, it's just, mm. I think it's irrelevant, to be mm. honest with you. Potentially irrelevant. I don't know. Mm. Ben, have you thought about this paper, Ben? It's really important because yeah, it's going mean, to have a lot of influence in the field, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I have some like quite basic methodological questions. I mean, how confident are they that they haven't just like lies a bit of the MHC and that's what they're picking up when they immunoprecipitate? So I mean, if you, you know, they've, they've dissolved the the MHC mm -hmm. off from the cell, right, with a kind of lysis, and then the idea is that they've kind of eluted out the peptide itself and sequenced it. But I don't, I don't really understand how, if you're claiming it's it's truly the same part of the same molecule that you sequence, how you can be so sure that you haven't just yeah, yeah. lysed the just... molecule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know much about the method. Like, is this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why. I, that's one of the. That's one of the questions I also had is the methodology because this needs to have some hardcore immunologists who work with MHC and peptide and peptide libraries to actually say this method. I assume it's. It's got. Well, I mean, I wouldn't assume the peer review process is always as robust as it's meant to be. Even if it's mm -hmm. in cell, I wouldn't assume it's right. You know. Um, but you're right. It could easily be. But then you would have expected it to be the same from the monocyte. So there is a different difference between. The two. Mm. Unless I mean they they have different they have different densities of MHC two on the surface. Mm. Might be different localization. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's explainable. I mean the, the other thing is uh, the other question I had is. I think he's gone. Yes. But, Ben, we've lost you, Ben. B cell to B cell. We lost you there, Ben. Can you repeat oh, that? Sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, I, I didn't get a flavor from the paper of how much normal variability there is in the immunopeptidome. So how much yeah. like, B cell to B cell difference is there? That variation mm. isn't captured at all. And we don't know, does this represent one or two clones that have happened to also proliferate maybe they've done something in you know in when they've taken the ex vivo that's led to those clones also proliferating in culture i have no idea but it would be interesting to see that repertoire because this represents a repertoire right yeah. and we're yeah mm -hmm. so that was not a question i had so but so what, i mean what, the difference from these other so one of the things one of the things we do know is that um the number of mhc molecules on a b cell that are required to activate a t cell is much much lower much much lower than on a on a on a mm. monocyte or a because of CD40. Uh, mm. Yes, because of the because of the co-stimulation. So the mm. co-stimulation lowers the threshold for um, activation of T cells massively. Mm. Um, mm. So the immunopeptidome on a B cell has got to be very very important in the mm. context of MS because of the B cell hypothesis. Mm. Um, I don't know if David, do you think this paper is, is retrofitting the uh, dogma? In, in I'm sure that's part of it. Um, I mean, obviously, that they it's 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 kind of a technology and, and heavy technology. Um, and then, obviously, it's, you know, they're trying to spin an immunological dogma. Um, and, so, and so, is there a system for creating? Um, is there a system for creating like ghost MHC signaling molecules? Um, could you could could you put an MHC on a on a plate and activate a T cell? With the right co-stimulation, without having any other B cell biology there. In other words, you can fill the mm. MH, the recombinant uh, MHC with the peptides you want. Is there, is there anything like that you can do? But I think as uh, Ben Brent probably hit it. You know, you, you need that co-stimulatory. No, 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 uh, I want to say, can you can you create a fake um, MHC slash co-stimulatory signal where you can actually just keep. Um, Put in the right peptide or the different peptide in that MHC without having to have a processing in, in, inside an antigen presenting cell. Mm. That's the question we need. That's the question I would think you. Would a, a, a question I had as well is how how far away are we from being able just to predict from the amino acid sequence of of the MHC genes what they're going to respond to? Because I mean, with the DeepMind stuff, presumably that that is now not pipe dream. That will be next twenty years. 
and that will be it. Once you can do that, you can predict the peptides. And I imagine then what we'll see. Well, is- I don't, you're better, you're, the peptides are so damn short, you know, depending on which one, mm-hmm. five to seven uh, amino acids long, you know, so they're very, very short. Actually, you may get a bit longer. Some some of the MHCs can take nine or I think maybe 11. Mm-hmm. That's not an but- intractable problem, right? If you can, if you can do no. the folding in silico, you know what the groove looks like, and then you can do clever... You, know, you can model what all the things will look like in the groove because that i mean with the protein structure stuff that deep mind are doing that yeah. is those yeah. are the kinds of interactions that they can model yeah. see the thing we do, we do i don't think we have what you know when you use um what's, what's that technology when you use the affinity of antibodies it's biocore you know the biocore yeah. technology biocore i mean i remember learning from ed thompson when i was in his lab saying that antibodies are monogamous they make they make they they, they make they made to an antigen and uh, you can normally sort out the low affinity ones from the high affinity ones. Mm-hmm. They orders of magnitude difference, and they usually only respond to that epitope. You know, so you may get you may get epitopes um, that are cross reactive, but it's because the epitope is the true epitope. Whereas T cells, he used to call them prostitutes. You know, they accommodate mm-hmm. the, anything, <laughs> they, but they very rarely react to anything. <laughs> you know, and so I'm, and one of the problems I will have is it's it's going to require some really good technology. To show mm-hmm. that um, uh, a particular, but there was also a paper from Vukovic, David. Remember, they yeah. they showed that different peptides, the the, the uh, MHC can respond to different uh, T cell receptors, and so it may activate one and not the other. So that's another thing you're going to have. It's very complex. It'll, 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 it'll require enormous data sets, and I'm sure they must exist. To be able yeah. to use a deep mind artificial intelligence approach to, to try and model which uh, uh, peptide activates which because there's, there's there's three things there's the MHC there's the peptide and there's the T cell receptor yeah. and that's going to create quite a lot of complexity. I mean, it, most T cells can respond. Really what? No, sorry. no, David. You, you... No, I was saying most T cells as well can detect numerous different uh, MHCs, can't they? You know, because that's where, you know, the basis of graft rejection. So, you know, any one T cell can respond to lots and lots of different mm. MHCs. And uh, maybe this has got something to do with that. Yeah, but the problem is, I, 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 mean, I mean, all the questions we've asked in this paper yeah. is how would you design the next set of experiments to prove or disprove this uh, paper's findings? Um I think you'd have to go from the B cell and do experiments around the B cell. And then you'd have to do experiments around a professional anti- uh, an, yeah. a- an APC. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the worrying thing is, is, is they just seem to jump from one place to the next and then and the next, and they never seem to follow the things through. It's, you know, so it makes you wonder, doesn't it? I mean, maybe obviously it's, it's some, uh, uh, one other person within the, in the lab's project, and of course, there's probably 50 of them doing yep. different things at the same time. But so, Ben, um, I don't know if you're aware, but um, Roland Martin, when he was at the NIH, they designed an altered peptide ligand trial, APL trial. The theory then was long before we knew about uh, uh, the, the DR2A 2B story, um, they actually w- wanted to shift the T cell response from a TH1 to a TH2. Okay. Mm. And so they, they designed an altered peptide ligand. Um, now, there were two trials. There was a commercial trial at the, at the same time using the same altered peptide ligand as the NIH trial. But what Roland Martin did at the NIH, I don't know why, they recruited patients that were DR4. Almost all the patients in the trial had DR4. They all responded to uh, the altered peptide ligand pathologically. And quite a few of the patients, I think there were two or three, mm. quite, there was two or three, they got Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, so in other words, in my, um, and it was a, and it was an MVP altered peptide ligand. So it, it was actually proof that MVP wasn't part, not part of MS because. Um, but the other trial, which was the uh, commercial study, that was the one that Larry Steinman was on, David. Eh? Yeah. They used the same altered peptide ligand, and in that situation, they just caused allergic reactions, uh, yeah. capex, capexone type allergic reactions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think you're fucking with nature. I think I think trying to drug the MHC is asking for trouble until you understand yeah. a lot better what yeah, you're doing yeah i agree yeah anyway anyway that was kind of the end of the ultra peptide ligand story because nothing happened after that did it david no well there was a big big argument between the two it just went backwards and forwards if you kind of look in sort of science and a few other things 
there was like they're all going between the two at the time. It was quite funny, but it was a mad Actually, idea. Then there, was, then there was a Canadian trial, Dave. Remember that big Canadian trial in the secondary progressive patients? Yeah. That was also an altered peptide ligand, but I think it was a different well, it one. Was, it was just smiling. I mean, the thing is that the whole altered peptide ligand stuff was a nonsense. Because, you know, you could do, always do what you could do with an altered peptide ligand with the peptide. It was just the root that was kind of the key. And, you know... That's, that's where it all came unstuck. And then, you know, they did a trial and then they went back and do the animal experiment and said, hey, look, it causes anaphylaxis. Yeah, that, but that, so the anaphylaxis, that population was DR2 positive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, the thing the is, DR, is they, DR2 negative population, the DR4, yeah. they, they induced demyelination and yeah. made the disease they, sh they showed in a separate paper that acted as a, an agonist as opposed to this altered peptide ligand in, in the DR4. So uh, again, unbelievable that they spent all this work and then then did the trial without actually typing the patients yeah to, to test this could you try and tolerize people to these self peptides so like give them exhausted car t cells or something are, there, are people doing like exhausted car t cells you can uh, I don't know, it, what's the best way of trying to tolerize them to it that'd be the killer experiment i think and i don't think it'll work <laughs> Can we do that? Well, the thing is, can you do it in humans? You know, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know how the CAR T cells are going to answer the question, Ben. Explain it to me. No, well, I don't mean proper T cells. I mean, I don't, is there a way of tolerizing people? Because if you, so if you think that the, this these auto reactive. But they are already naturally toler tolerized eh, because they don't respond very well to the self peptides. Yeah, well, I mean, because they because they've been they've been educated in the thymus not yeah. to respond yeah. too aggressively, so it's mm. that intermediate. I mean, there's a I mean that uh, positive selection in the thymus is because they are not. Mm. Sorry, it's a negative selection in the thymus. Yeah. They're not that autoreactive. Um, I don't know. How to I mean, one of the problems about these kinds of papers is that they become dogma and everybody accepts this as the pathogenesis of MS. And that that edit that uh, commentary by Hauser mm. and uh, Zam, uh, Scott Zamville is going to make it worse. Because it now considered to be a very important paper, mm. you know, ABV and the gut to uh, autoreactive T cells with mimicry, with the two DR the two DR two receptors, and now this will become the new dogma in MS. This is how dogma is created. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, ask, just going back, another thing I didn't quite pick up is, was it the same in healthy people? No, no, no. The, so oh, it wasn't the same in healthy people. So there is more proliferation of the T cells and the um, response in terms of cytokines in people with MS compared to healthy people. And mm. also there were differences in the stimulation capacity of, um, for example, this EBV versus other mm. um, uh, bacteria. And um, yeah. The self-presentation, was that, mm. they found self-presentation of yes. the DR peptide. the self-presentation was also in, in, healthy, um, in healthy controls, but induced less proliferation mm. than in people with MS. Mm. It, I, just, so just straight broadly, it can't be, it can't be a killer information, can it? If this phenomenon is happening in healthy people, I mean, the fact that the, the T cell response is quite different in the MS patients, it might be, it, it might be to do with the T cells. It might be nothing to do with the self presentation. So for me, the, the fact that this phenomenon is occurring in the healthy people as well tells you this is. No, but I think it's about the, the way answer. it's about the way you respond to it. No, the fact that self presentation and that there is maybe that there is a sort of reaction in healthy individuals that's what you expect in them as that it's a spectrum with normality no that's just a, a sort of um mm. gradient of reactivity that um pushes you over the threshold i expect everything that happens yeah. in ms to to also be some way relevant in people in healthy in healthy people well i, I personally think we need to i think we need to we need to write a commentary of this for mzars um, and incorporate the altered peptide ligand literature that's 20 years old 15 years old into this uh, there's another one. There's another altered peptide ligand story, which also is bullshit. Is this still be recording? Um, yes, I, I can. 